on. You can start recording. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our local bridge guidance workshop for the PennDOT District 10 area. My name is Dominic DeAndrea, and I am the Director of Transportation Planning here at the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. Next slide. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get rolling here. Uh, please continue to mute your microphone and have your camera off. Um, we ask that you enter any questions you have into the chat box, which is in the lower right hand corner. Um, and the questions will be will be uh, addressed at the conclusion of the presentation. And the presentation will be provided via email to all registered participants. And we will also we're recording this so that it can be shared with folks who couldn't make it with us today. Next slide. So um, today's workshop is being presented to you by PennDOT District 10, which serves Armstrong, Butler, Indiana, Jefferson and Clarion counties, and the metropolitan planning organizations serving those counties, including the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission, um, the North Central Commission and the Northwest Regional Planning Commission. Collectively, we have received a number of inquiries concerning local bridges. So we thought it would be a good idea to provide some information in this workshop setting. Um, I'm going to oh, oh, go back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask uh, Assistant District Executive Alice Hammond to introduce herself and um, say a few words. Yes, Tom, can you hear me? Yep, Alice. Everything working? Right. Thank you, hello. Um, yes, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank everyone for calling in today. It's good to see a number, uh, a good participation on the participants list there. We've got a lot of really good information to share. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our team. We have a lot of very knowledgeable staff that have been involved in putting this presentation together to help you out, help answer questions and give you information on how to move forward on working on replacing and managing some of the bridges that you may own. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our staff. We have Eric Bouchon, he's our uh, portfolio plans engineer. Um, Rich Gills, our district bridge engineer, and he's gonna go over our approach to asset management, asset management for our bridges. Um, Anthony Pioli is our bridge inspection supervisor, and he will go over our local bridge inspection program and bridge priorities and what they mean to you. Um, Jason Barkey is a project manager in our bridge unit and has a lot of experience in dealing with some of our local bridge replacement projects. He's going to go over the consultant agreement development process. And Dave Lehman is a senior project manager in our design unit, and he's going to assist Jason and actually go through the project development process. Um, and Harold is our pl planning and programming manager. Harold does a lot behind the scenes and communicates directly with each of our planning organizations um, and uh, coordinates with them throughout the TIP development process. Dominic DeFazio, also planning and programming, uh, assist Harold with the planning and programming activities. Um, Justin Ruggles is a planner in planning and programming, and he's going to be discussing our PennDOT Connects process and the opportunities that you have during that time to provide input um, on any of your concerns or issues that you have on a particular project as that project is becoming uh, programmed for some type of improvement. And Dom, would you like to go ahead and introduce yep. your staff? Yep. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for that. Um, um, I, and uh, the staff, SPC staff that's with us today includes Ryan Gordon, our transportation program development manager, and John Weber, who is our transportation program development planner. Both these guys work on the transportation improvement program, where bridges get programmed into our, you know, into our tip and you know the month-to-month -month changes that we make to to that program i uh, appreciate these two fellows being here as well uh, next I'm, i want to invite uh i think we have amy kessler now on 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 board here amy are you here I'm amy here, Tesla, How are you? is regional planning director for north central commission amy do you, you want to introduce yourself and say a few words 
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as Dom said, I'm Amy Kessler. I manage the transportation program for the sister agencies uh, northeast of, of the Pittsburgh area covering Cameron, Clearfield, Elk, Jefferson, McKean, and Potter County. And for this presentation, primarily looking at the coordination we do directly with the good folks at District 10 for Jefferson County. Thanks, Amy. And I also want to invite Travis Siegel, the uh, regional planning manager for Northwest Commission. Travis, Thank are you. you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Don? Nice. Yep. Hi, Travis. Perfect. Yeah. Um, like Amy, I am uh, the regional tra transportation planning manager up here at the Northwest um, Planning Commission. Um, like her, I have several counties. Um, those include Warren, Forest, Clarion, Venango, Crawford, and um, and Clarion, I'm sorry, and but primarily we will be focusing on Clarion as that is uh, the county that I have that's in the District 10 region. So thank you, Dom. Thank you, Travis. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, you know, collectively, the MPOs, District 10, we received inquiries concerning local bridges. So I, again, we thought it would be a really good idea to provide the information in this in this sort of workshop environment. So um, in terms of the presentation you're about to see, we would like to provide an overview of PennDOT's bridge unit and the PennDOT folks will be uh, on for that. Um, then Ryan of, of my staff is going to talk about the MPO RPO role and overall uh, transportation improvement program tip process. And then we're going to review, we're going to have a review of available funding sources for local bridge projects. We're going to discuss project administration and local assistance for municipalities and, and local governments in, in general. And uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Next slide, please. The objectives of our workshop are really to familiarize municipalities and, and local governments generally with PennDOT's bridge unit and their role in bridge inspections, bridge maintenance, and priority maintenance repair examples. Uh, another objective would be to review PennDOT district bridge asset management philosophy and go over some of the district contacts you may need when you have bridge local bridge needs. Uh, provide an understanding of the MPO RPO role in the overall TIP process. Uh, we also want to educate local governments about available funding sources for local bridge projects. Uh, provide an understanding that bridge needs exceed the available resources. So yeah, uh, even though we've gotten some IIJA funds, there are a lot of bridge needs out there and uh, we wanna give you an understanding of that and provide an understanding of the project development process and understand local government's role in project administration and delivery. Next slide. And so with that, I think I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Pioli, who Pioli, who's the um, who's the bridge inspection supervisor at PennDOT District 10. Thanks, Dom. Can Pioli? you hear me? All right. Yep. Thank you. Take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Pioli, and I'm the bridge inspection supervisor here for District 10. And uh, part of my job is to oversee the local bridge inspection program, and We'll just kind of dive right into the details here. If you want to next slide, please. Um, so you might be wondering which bridges are required to be inspected. Well, the federal government sets a um, length that needs to be met, and that's over 20 feet in length. And sometimes we get question on, well, which dimension is the length of the bridge? Um, that would be the abutment to abutment or it's also called your clear span length. Um, some people ask if the structure length would be guide rail to guide rail, and that would be considered the bridge width. So what we're um, concerned here about is the structure length. So that would be pretty much what your roadway is spanning. Um, and with that, uh, PennDOT has a rating um, system, how we rate our bridges, good, fair, and poor. And um, based on that, we set our uh, inspection intervals for the bridges. Uh, our standard inspection interval is 24 months, and 
it could be reduced to a 12 month inspection or a six month inspection even if uh, the bridge is in poor condition, such as if a uh, steel member has some deterioration or if the bridge is posted for a weight limit, um, we're gonna look at that bridge on a uh, less interval. And then moving on, who performs these inspections? Uh, PennDOT maintains contracts uh, with uh, consultant inspection firms that are qualified to inspect these bridges. Uh, again, the federal government sets these qualifications um, for a team leader and a team helper so that they're qualified to be inspecting these bridges. Um, and then the municipalities have the option to enter into agreements with qualified inspection firms outside of the PennDOT agreements. Um, and there are two separate ways to get these agreements set up, and we'll talk about that on the next slide if we can go. Um, so I want to start off before we get into who pays for the inspections. Um, there's two uh, agreements. There's a PennDOT agreement, and then there's a local agreement. In District 10, um, all five counties are, um, well, let me take that back. Four out of the five counties are under a PennDOT agreement and Indiana County is under a uh, local agreement. Um, however, all five counties assume the cost for the local municipalities. Um, for example, uh, North Central, we have Jefferson County. There are 45 local bridges that we have under contract and get inspected. Uh, Northwest, there in Clarion County, we have 50 bridges. And in SPC, Armstrong, we have 68 bridges. Butler, we have 144 bridges. And Indiana, we have 79 bridges. So in total, in District 10, we have 386 local bridges that we have under contract with consultant firms that get inspected. Um, so you might be wondering, do I have any local bridges in my municipality? Um, every year I send out a letter to the local owners notifying them of the inspection coming up that year. So if you receive letters, then those would be the bridges that I'm talking about right now. Now on to the uh, PennDOT agreement, how I was talking about setting these up. Um, it's split 80-20, so 80% 80 of the funds are federal and 20% are a local match. Uh, that 20% is deducted from the liquid fuel funds. And so that means that basically the county is not uh, directly paying the consultant for these inspections. Um, it's coming out of their liquid fuel budget. And then the other type is the local agreements, which need a reimbursement agreement set up for that. Um, the municipality pays the consultant inspection firm 100% of the cost. And then when the municipality submits for the reimbursement, PennDOT would then uh, send the 80% from the federal funds. Uh, next slide, please. Um, moving on to a bridge analysis. So how do we determine what loads are safe for our bridges? So load rating analysis are done as part of the design and warranted over the life of the bridge. Um, so basically when a bridge is designed, we have a load rating done that determines with that bridge being uh, brand new, as new condition, it's gonna um, hold these load loads. And then as over the years, when the bridge starts to deteriorate, um, those loads are gonna decrease. So our engineers will analyze um, what those loads may be. Uh, when are the analysis is updated? Um, I want to throw an example out here. Um, <clears throat> say if a township or a borough is paving a strip of roadway and there's a bridge in that section. Sometimes that bridge may get uh, overlaid with that pavement, and that can in turn uh, lower the load rating for that structure because we're adding, you know, two inch, three inch pavement of uh, extra dead load to that structure. Um, so that would be an example of the new pavement could lower the 
the amount that the loads could carry. Um, and also during the inspection, like I said, if an inspector finds any deterioration, that could cause the load rating to decrease. Um, as for if there was no changes from the last inspection, there's not uh, standards right now of to when these load ratings need to be updated, but a rule of thumb that I think a lot of districts follow is after seven years, um, we like to get a new up, uh, date on the load rating to make sure that everything is still accurate. Next slide. Now moving on to the priority maintenance repairs. Um, we have a priority zero being the worst and a priority five um, not being the worst, I guess you would say. So priority zero um, has to be completed within seven days. So if an inspector goes out and finds a safety issue um, on that bridge, that would be considered a priority zero and that would have to be fixed within seven days. Um, a priority one would be Less significant, uh, you have a six month time frame for that. And then a priority two, um, we recommend that that be fixed within 24 months or the next <clears> inspection <throat> frequency. And then the priority three through fives are um, just added to the scheduled work. Next slide. Um, how do we find out about these priority maintenance items? Well, the inspectors will notify the municipality and uh, spend on in the same day and we will coordinate with the local owner um, to follow up and get a plan of action in place um, like i said a priority zero would need to be fixed in seven days and a priority one is in six months um, something that we do in district 10 if there's a priority two or a three that's less significant but we see it um, maybe in 24 months, it could become a priority zero or one. We actually reach out to the township or uh, borough and give them a heads up just to say, hey, this is, say this steel beam is deteriorating rather quickly. Um, you know, you might wanna start looking at a repair plan uh, because we know that it takes a while to get um, contractors under contract and everything. So we like to give the owners a heads up that that might be coming in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'm just gonna go through a couple examples. Uh, they're not um, specific to any bridges in this, uh, in the counties, but they're just pictures of examples. Uh, so th this would be a steel beam. Um, you could see that it's severely deteriorated. Um, it actually has 100% section loss. And we would consider this, um, severe and it could result in a bridge closure. Um, next slide. Another priority zero example would be this um, bearing deterioration. Uh, the concrete should be underneath that whole uh, beam seat and you can see it's deteriorated. So it's the loss of bearing. Um, this one was just carrying a sidewalk. Um, so there's not any vehicle live load on this beam, um, but we would still uh, consider it severe and we would probably close the sidewalk in this case and then um, would want this fixed within seven days. Next slide. Um, load posting signs. This is considered a priority zero item as well. Um, this would be if a bridge is posted due to weight, um, as you can see in that picture, we have the bridge sign up top, the tonnage for the weight limit and the combination vehicle tonnage. Uh, a lot of times these get um, vandalized with graffiti or just even removed. Um, and if it's not up at the bridge, it's considered a priority zero and we'd wanna get a new sign in place within seven days. Next slide, please. Another example of a priority one, we have a cracked uh, steel truss member here. And um, the load carrying capacity of this member is not affected, um, but we would still want to address the cracked member. Um, this would be more of a six month time frame. 
Next slide, please. Uh, another priority one example would be a deteriorating and leaking deck joint. So as you can see in that picture, um, a lot of the, the joint has detached from the steel member and this allows water to get down on the beam ends. Um, as though this is not a structural priority, it um, will start to deteriorate. If you have salt water dripping down through there, it'll start to deteriorate those uh, load carrying members. And we want to we want to prevent that deterioration from happening. So this would be a six month time frame to get this joint uh, sealed up. Next slide, please. Um, priority one example would be tripping hazard. Uh, this is a sidewalk, as you can see, is a hole in the sidewalk with some rebar exposed uh, that serves as a tripping hazard and danger to the, the public. Um, we'd want to get the sidewalk repaired here in six months um, so that it does not, uh, so nobody trips over it. Um, another example of a priority one, too, this could be similar is in a concrete bridge deck, a pothole similar to this. If we would have the rebar exposed, it could puncture a tire of a traveling car, and we'd also want to get that fixed within six months. Next slide, please. Uh, with Okay, so that's the end of the priorities, and now moving on to the bridge inspection reports. So after the bridge inspectors complete their inspection, um, they type up a report and send it to us for review. And once we accept that, we will then um, transfer that report to the owners. Um, some of the counties receive these electronically and some of the counties receive them paper copy. Uh, all the local owners, uh, if they're the township or borough, we send them uh, the paper copies in the mail. Uh, it, also, another way to look at these reports would be in our bridge management system, BMS2. Um, the link there is on the screen, and if you'd want to gain access to that, you just contact our PennDOT, PennDOT IT service desk at that number. And also, um, if you have any other questions uh, about your bridges or if your bridges are getting inspected, um, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my number is there on the screen along with my email. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich Gill, our district bridge engineer. Hi there, Anthony, before you leave, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yep. Okay, Sounds great. Good, Rich. Good, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Anthony stated, I'm the district bridge engineer here in District 10 for PennDOT. Um, today's slide, I'll be going over the bridge asset management. Uh, basically, I wanted to give a brief overview of how bridge projects will be selected moving forward. But moreover, just some of the terminologies you may be hearing when we start talking about bridge selections, bridge programming, things like that. So on the slide, you see under the philosophy, our, our first item there is the transportation asset management plan. Uh, and that's nothing more than a federal requirement that each state has to develop a plan. And that plan will show how the each state uh, is planning to handle their assets, uh, fund their, their program, and basically take the funding through the life cycle of the, of the assets, our roadways, our bridges, and so forth. So that brings us to the the first term there, the lowest life cycle cost. And uh, it's kind of the switch in our philosophy. Um, so what is what is the lowest life cycle cost? Well, it's basically what it says. It, it's trying to achieve the lowest life or lowest cost over the life of the structure. So in other words, the longer the bridge lasts, the lower the cost will be over the structure's life. So that's pretty much what this plan is trying to get to versus what we used to do, which was worse first. Um, you've probably all heard about the structurally deficient bridges, which is now termed poor bridges. Um, so that was our old philosophy, and it actually worked. We really reduced our numbers of poor bridges, but now we're transitioning to the slowest life cycle cost philosophy to try to preserve bridges. Um, and that way we'll keep good bridges good, and still try to chisel away at some of the some of the poorer bridges. Um, the the on the screen to the right, I hope everybody can see that. Um, I just want to give a 
a snapshot of where the district stood by county, um, the S and L or stand for state and local, and the number behind each S and L is the number of currently poor bridges. So these numbers were these numbers a decade ago were much much higher. So we really reduced the numbers. Um, and some of them, for instance, like Indiana County, uh, we still have 85 poor bridges versus the local 10 bridges. So we still have a lot of work to do in Indiana County on the poor side. Uh, versus Clarion County, which uh, actually the local four bridges outnumber the state four bridges. So in that situation, we might be looking to, to pick up some more of those local bridges and bring those projects on board. Uh, the lowest life cycle cost versus worst cost, as back to this, it, you see the three words there, replacement, rehabilitation versus preservation. Uh, so worst first, we were really going after replacements. We were replacing anything that was poor. So reversing to the new direction, or I shouldn't say reversing, but moving towards a new direction, uh, we're going to move more towards the rehabilitation and preservation options versus the replacement options. So what that might mean to, to the owners and to the public is you might see a lot of work being done on bridges that may appear good, uh, and that, that is by plan. The, the idea is to maintain those bridges in good condition so that they don't become poor. The um, moving on, the, so some of the tools that we use to get that is bridge care. Uh, we also call that BAMS, you might hear that term. Uh, bridge care is a program that basically applies our funding allotments to the bridge assets to achieve the lowest life cycle cost over the structure's life. So the BAMS program utilizes deterioration models and applies the treatments such as deck replacements, overlays, superstructure replacements to extend the life of that structure as long as possible. Uh, the, the program is still under development, under refinement. There should be a new version actually coming out to the district here probably the end of this year, or early next year. And that will be part of the TAMP that the state is going to put in to our state's plan to, to give to the federal government and how we're going to maintain our bridges. Now, in BAMS, as Anthony mentioned earlier, BAMS utilizes some other programs that we have, such as uh, BMS2, that's our Bridge Management System 2. Uh, bridge Management System 3 will be coming out. Um, that's another upgraded version. But BAM, or I'm sorry, BMS2 currently holds all the bridge information, structure condition, inspection data, everything we need to know about a condition of a bridge. And the bridge care or BAM system utilize that information to develop then. It knows how long a bridge is going to be in good condition, fair condition, poor condition. And it uses that information to apply the funding so that that bridge can be extended in life for as long as possible. Um, so my name and contact is at the bottom of the screen. Again, my name is Richard Gill. Uh, my phone number is there. My email address is there. If you have any questions in the upcoming tip updates or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me. And that's all I have on the bridge asset management slide. And I believe I'm turning it over to Ryden Gordon. Dom, am I correct? Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get we'll take a little break from all of the technical bridge stuff and Ryan is going to uh, get into uh, MPOs, what we do and, and more of the, the planning aspect. Ryan? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so hello, I'm Ryan Gordon. I'm manager of the transportation uh, program development here at SPC. I'll be running through an overview of planning organizations, which there are three of um, in District 10. And I'll be talking a little bit about the role that they fill in transportation planning. Um, so, like I said, throughout the slides um, that I'm going to cover, you're going to be hearing me refer to MPOs and RPOs or MPO RPOs. These are metropolitan planning organizations or rural planning organizations, and they have a key role in the transportation planning process. The there's two uh, rural R or RPOs, um, and that is in Clarion County and Jefferson. 
and that is North Central uh, PA Regional Planning Commission and the Northwest PA Commission. And then the remaining three counties are in uh, are part of the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. Um, so the RPO and MPO or MPO RPOs, they are a forum for identifying needs and proposing solutions and determining where and how federal transportation dollars are spent within the planning area. So this is completed with the aid of transportation studies, analysis, additional planning activities, and they really <clears throat> facilitate a collaborative approach to decision making. Uh, RPOs and MPOs are regarded as the forum for cooperative transportation tr decision making within their areas. And they are comprised of local elected officials, predominantly county commissioners, along with officials from both the USDOT and PennDOT, transit agencies, and other stakeholders and other agencies. Now, I will note that each of these three planning organizations have additional counties that extend beyond the District 10 uh, PennDOT area. So what about um, MPOs and RPOs and what do they do? They are key to the transportating, transportation planning process because they are, as I said, a forum and the, they are the facilitators of a regional collaboration and cooperation. MPOs and RPOs coordinate the regional transportation planning efforts, culminating in the production of a four-year transportation improvement program, or TIP, and also the long-range transportation program, long-range long -range transportation plan for that region. They also provide technical assistance on certain project development and project delivery aspects. They also serve as centers for regional data, so um, census data, traffic data, anything related to transit, a bunch of different data that, that the MPOs, RPOs house. They also conduct transit planning and run commuter van pool programs. And they also um, have a role in uh, some aspects of economic development and um, one example of that is providing small business loans um, and low, low interest loans for, for small businesses and uh, providing us expertise mm -hmm. on uh, financing to uh, small businesses. So in the realm of transportation planning, um, there's a lot of different participants in the process. And it first and foremost um, begins with public involvement. And there is a wide array of efforts that are conducted by both PennDOT and the MPO RPOs to involve the public. There's also a wide array of professionals at both the federal, state, regional, county, and municipal levels. Um, their expertise uh, as as you can see, just by this webinar, it, it spans a lot of experts in the fields of transportation planning and, and engineering, bridge engineering, safety um, and highway engineering, along with stakeholders from other groups, in, including freight or ped bike or multimodal stakeholders. And it also includes um, experts from um, our agencies that oversee us, like FHWA or FTA. So the ne next section really focuses on providing a review of some of the funding that's used on local bridge projects. This funding can really be broken down into two main areas that I'm going to go into. One is um, TIP funds and the other is non-TIP funds. So first I'm going to cover the TIP funding. Um, the TIP funding is what SPC Northwest and North Central work on along with the staff of PennDOT District 10 Planning and Programming to really put these federal funds into our, our transportation improvement pro program. And these are the funds that are included in that program. 
So TIP is short for Transportation Improvement Program. It's required to be updated every two years in the regions in Pennsylvania. It's identifying transportation investments and the priority for those projects over a four year period. There are two sides of the TIP, the transit side of the TIP, which focuses on, on funding the transit agencies and the transit operations. And then there is the highway bridge part of the TIP that we'll be discussing here in the next few slides. The highway bridge tip includes a variety of investments that go towards improving the transportation network, including on roadways and bridges, but also including safety, uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and other transportation related projects and programs. The MPO RPOs work closely with each of the PennDOT districts in their area, including for this presentation, District 10. The planning professionals they work with are included at both PennDOT and the member counties. In SPC area, we, we refer to this coordination as the TIP development work groups. Um, and there's a similar role for, for the other two planning regions as well. These work groups represent a vast array of professionals in, in in the transportation planning sector. And the MPO RPO's role as the facilitator focuses on the, developing a collaborative approach and, de, and coming to consensus to develop the TIP in each of the PennDOT districts. Then it's merged together for the entire region, eventually merged together for the entire state to create what we call the STIP. As a federal requirement of the TIP, it has to be fiscally constrained which means we are strictly adhering to the amount of federal funds and state funds that we have available in each of the four years. The funding for these projects cannot exceed the established constraints in these funding pots. Local entities are encouraged to monitor projects that are going to be in your municipality because it's gonna provide you opportunities to collaborate through what's called the PennDOT Connects process. This is allowing you to discuss the goals and the needs of your community um, or your county with your MPO and your PennDOT district staffs in advance of projects that get the, uh, funded on the TIP. So TIP development, as I mentioned, the MPO RPO is the facilitator of the TIP development and the process. This process is built on continuing uh, collaboration, and here's a list of a few of the tasks that are taken on throughout the development of the draft tip. When we're developing the draft tip, we first have to take a look at funding what we call carryover projects. These are the projects that have stayed, um, have started on previous tips, and need to be carried over to the programming that we're working on to be finished in construction. In most TIP updates, the carryover projects take up a large uh, percentage of the available funding. The process also takes a full look and a full review at all public comments and looks at all candidate projects proposed by the public and by members of the TIP work groups, including um, counties, municipalities, and uh, different units of PennDOT. For example, SPC had over eight work group meetings just in District 10 in the development of our most recent TIP. <clears throat> when it comes to candidate projects for the TIP, there are three main avenues for those projects to be submitted for consideration. The first one would be via public comment. This is in the form of either the State Transportation Commission comments at the outset of the TIP update or through comments directly to your MPO RPO through a official comment period. Basically, the STC comment period um, kicks off the TIP approximately 15 months ahead of adoption. The additional comments come through our, our official comment period that's held on the draft just prior to adoption. The second avenue is via your county planning office. 
Each county has planning offices and you can submit your candidate projects to them and they will provide them at the correct time uh, when we're working on TIP development on, of the draft TIP. And the third avenue is via PennDOT District 10. So you can refer your concerns or your candidate project to the District 10 bridge folks. Um, and like I said, bridge, highway, safety, it's all under District 10 and they're continually looking at candidate projects and candidate lists and presenting them to the TIP work group at the pro proper time in the process. So I just wanted to provide a little bit, a couple bullets here that, that show just a handful of the folks that work on the TIP development in District 10. There's a lot of expertise here from various units at PennDOT District 10, along with key planners, public works folks from the counties, SPC staff, um, and staffs from both Northwest and North Central. And then of course the member counties um, that work on it with, on this tip development as well. This is a very good group of professionals that work in a very professional and collaborative manner when it comes to developing our tip. Just giving you um, some background here. This is a graph that depicts the tip revenue trends over the past several tips. It's broken out by each MPO, RPO, and you can see that we had been on a downward trajectory kind of in our funding since about 2015 with the passage of the Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act back in November, which has greatly helped our 2023 TIP in District 10 um, get a lot more funding. <clears throat> um, just this is more background, but the investment in bridges is very significant. Um, just looking at available funding for bridges, if you look at these three planning regions, there's around 40% of our funding is designated for bridge work. And so I know in SPC, the amount that we spend in, in bridge work is even just a little bit higher than that. But um, you can see bridges, um, you, you, I didn't break it down by every different investment category, but bridges are the number one bridge or the number one investment category in the tip. So reiterating what I started out with at the top there, funding for local bridge work can be through funding on the tip or can be through non tip funding. So. I'm going to run through now a little bit of um, information on non tip funding and tip funding. So I'm going to start with um, the slides that deal with the tip fund. So all the information in detail you can also find on the SPC website um, in our local bridge funding guide. And there'll be a link to that site at the end of this presentation. So focusing on tip funds first, um, here are some of our federal and state tip funds that can be placed on local bridges or bridges, you know, owned by local entities. However, the key is this last bullet. If local bridges are funded with federal and state tip funds, they must adhere to all federal regulations pertaining to project development. And that's going to be covered here by some PennDOT project managers in, in a few slides here, but that they're going to be providing just an overview of some of those requirements. Um, I have these little tables for each of the fund types that you, we can put money on bridge projects. And so um, this is right out of our funding guidebook that's on our website. So I'm going to go over these a little quickly, but all the information will be in that funding guidebook. This is a new um, source of funding that came about through IIJA. Uh, we call it BRIB or Bridge Investment Program. Its uh, funding is very flexible and can be utilized on or off 
system bridges, which means it can be used on the federal aid network or it can be used off the federal aid network in which almost all bridges, I believe in district 10 would be considered off the federal aid network. This is a funding type that could also be used on locally owned structures. Um, it, it, it is um, one of our most flexible um, funding types. However, this is only for projects that are on the federal aid system. Um, in District 11 in, in the city of Pittsburgh, we have a, a, a number of projects that are local bridges that are on the federal aid network. Like I said before, that's not common in District 10. This is the most common uh, form of TIP funds that we put on local bridge projects, and we call this bridge off system funding or bridge off the federal aid system. And you can see it typically requires um, a 20% match. And a lot of times that is met with a 15% state and a 5% local match. And the last fun type I wanted to highlight that's on the that's that we utilize on the tip is called appropriation 1 and 3 funds. These are actually state funds that are eligible for bridge projects. And we would typically use these. Um, like I said, on that 10 or 15% of matching funds that we put on when we utilize that um, bridge off system funding. So, in addition to TIP funding, there are multiple other fund sources that are distributed, but statewide, two counties, two municipalities, and even to PennDOT maintenance. And they are all um, listed here. I'm going to go over a couple of the highlights of these. Um, there are multiple funding sources that are not on the TIP. And, and like I said, they can be awarded through competitive programs. Due to the demand on our TIP bridge funds, these other funds are important for funding local bridges and they are available to uh, governments and they are important and they are a large portion of what actually gets utilized to fund local bridges. So here's a listing of some of those programs. For a complete description of all of these, you can see our local funding guide that I mentioned before. I'm only going to cover, I think, three of these today, um, the main ones. The first one is county and municipal liquid fuels allocation. So if you're on a if you're with a county or a municipality and you're tuning into this, these you're probably very familiar with these funds. They are predominant state funding source for local bridge infrastructure. Typically, they're dispersed directly to municipalities and directly to counties. Um, I think everyone's familiar with these funds and how flexible they are for use on both bridge maintenance and in, um, on bridge replacements. And this is the PennDOT Multimodal Transportation Fund. These are a competitive program that provides state funding through grants for a wide range of transportation infrastructure, including local bridges, and several local bridges within our region have been successful in obtaining this type of funding. There is also a similarly named program, but is with PABCED, and it's also called the Multimodal Transportation Fund, and it is also a competitive program that can provide state funds via grants to a wide range of transportation infrastructure. And I do believe we have had some bridge work that has utilized this source of funding also. And this is the last one I wanted to mention. This is the PA Infrastructure Bank. Um, it's really a great tool because it provides low interest loans um, to municipalities uh, to upgrade their infrastructure, including doing uh, local bridge projects. And 
it's really it's really a, what what they call a patient lender. Um, you have very low rates through these invest in infrastructure bank, and you have I think up to ten years to pay this off. And if if you're in a distressed um, economic situation in your municipality, you can even get even lower rates. Um, so it's just a good source of of loans. A lot of people don't want to hear about loans, but you know it really is a good option. I think they're. I looked it up the other day, and they were at like two and a half percent, which, um, you know, given given today's inflation, is a pretty good interest rate for infrastructure, and you're locking that in for ten years. So, um, that's all I wanted to give you as far as a background on on some of the funding. We're going to move into some. Um, slides that talk about project administration and project delivery. Most of the sources I just cited are, are federal funds and federal and state funds are going to trigger you to really follow uh, the requirements of of those funds. And so I'll guess I'll kick it back to Dom or directly to Jason Barkey to to take on the next couple of slides. I just wanted to slip in here a reminder to please Please uh, keep your microphones muted and also a reminder if a, if a question pops into your head, please use the chat box. We will review the questions at the end. So I think Jason Barkey is next. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jason Barkey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a, my name is Jason Barkey here. I uh, work in District 10 as a project manager, and I uh, just wanted to uh, go over a few things here. I'll be talking today about the project administration and delivery, um, project delivery. So uh, next slide, please. So for the project delivery, uh, we have, of course, BennDOT Statewide Transportation Improvement Program with a tip. And this is where the locals, we get money on here for talking about for locals, is the local transportation project is now, it's funded, it's programmed on TIP, so what do we do? Well, there's a uh, different steps here. We'll go ahead and we'll go on the next step, next slide here, please. All right, so pretty much for PennDOT projects, um, including local projects, they're managed using the Engineering and Construction Management System, or known as ECMS. Um, so the first thing you want to do is when you begin to uh, have fun with this is, you need to register as an ECMS business partner, um, and that will get you access to ECMS, and you can uh, proceed on with getting everything taken care of, as I'll explain here later. Um, also, you need to acquire a vendor number, vendor SAP number, um, which that's also, uh, and there's two links there, one for ECMS and the, uh, where you get the budgetpa.gov where you have the uh, SAP number. Um, also, there's telephone numbers also there if you want to call them to discuss that way too. Um, so to receive payments from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, or receive state and federal funds, uh, the sponsor must have a vendor recipe number for payments to be processed. Slide, please. So, ECMS is, uh, that's kind of the communication portal between uh, PennDOT and uh, business partners. And what this does is this allows, ECMS allows the consultants to submit um, statement of interest, or SOIs, or RFPs in some cases, you might have heard that term before, um, technical proposals and execute contracts and different agreements with the with, with PennDOT, their local sponsor. Um, the system uh, also you can use to process invoices. This is also includes for the local local system too, which is very nice. Um, also, contractors can review transportation projects and also submit electronic bids through this process too. Um, the construction contracts are managed through bidding through construction closeouts. So pretty much. From the way from start to finish is where ECMS, ECMS is used for, for the construction. And of all things, too, ECMS is available 24-7 um, for any time you need to. It's online. And also, if you have any questions, there's a help desk um, for it also. Hi, please. Okay, when you open, go to ECMS there, um, the website there, as you showed the previous slide there, um, you would see in the circle in the uh, it's circled there under register as a business partner. What you want to do there is click on that link, and that will take you to uh, the step-by-step the -step process on how to become a member, a uh, business partner for that. Um, it's very important that um, we kind of get the, get this probably done the right way. So what it is is, of course, there's different um, 
programs you can use to do this. One thing that's recommended, we have found that uh, in the past here, it's good to use um, Edge or Chrome for eCMS. Um, it's not recommended to use uh, your cell phone or a tablet because sometimes there's some glitches there, different things, it doesn't always work the right way. So if you can use your computer uh, using the um, Edge or the Chrome, that'd be great. That'd be Wow, good, to your, good for your benefit. So, um, next slide, please. All right, so once we get an ECMS here, then we uh, move into the reimbursement agreement system, or we're called the RAS system, R-E-S. Um, and what that is, is a uh, local sponsor, you enter into a reimbursement agreement with PennDOT to order to obtain a state and federal funding. Um, so this is where, um, to get the money for the project that's on the tip, you have to um, get into a reimbursement agreement. And what those are, they are agreements that are templates um, for each different type of project, so different templates. Um, and then we just kind of fill information regarding the specific project, and that's kind of where we want to proceed on with this. Now, to get access to the reimbursement agreement system, um, once you get the ECMS administration roles that are established, uh, you will get those once you get the application and then you get approved of that, they'll send you a link for what your um, roles are. You need to go into the administrative and the ECMS also and then add a reimbursement agreement system roles, so or RAS roles, into the system. Um, and rendering the same tour role is what you need to ex ex execute the agreement in RAS. So that's pretty much the person that will be signing, whether it be the, in the township or county or municipality, whatever it be. Um, the person that would have the signature authority to do that, uh, that person would be signing the role to that. Um, and then into, the, into so you have roles in ECMS and also into RAS. Now with RAS, um, it's recommended to use the edge um, because uh, sometimes in Chrome, it doesn't always work correctly. There's a time where sometimes it might, it might show it, but when you go back into it later, it's not there. So I recommend it to use the edge for RAS and also then the edge or the Chrome for the eCMS. Okay, so this is this is a kind of picture of there what the RAS uh, looks like there um, in the system here a little bit, and it kind of exposed shows different ways here. It shows like a search, shows express searches, different things, and biggest thing up here is on top is templates, agreements, reports, work queues, and RAS help. So uh, this tell you how to get into each of the agreements you have. So pretty much in the electronic um, reimbursement system, the agreements can take approximately to three to four months to go through the process, and that can be um, more or less depending on how, um, what, when they get into the system. Like for instance, if you have, say for instance, if agreement is, is um, into your, in your work queue, and say for instance it comes to you maybe uh, at the end of your, um, right, right after your meeting or before you, right before your meeting, you may need to wait to the next meeting or have a special meeting to have that to take care. That's up to you to do. So that's where sometimes, there's, sometimes the timing can be different for each, for each agreement. Um, the one thing for sure is also you need to remember is the agreements must be fully executed for any work can be reimbursed um, to be reimbursed can start. So pretty much you have to have reimbursement executed, your ECMS agreement and your RAS agreement have to be executed before any work can begin uh, for your consultant to have to get this proceed. And one thing about the reimbursement agreement program, it is a program, it is not a grant program. That's one thing I want to make sure that uh, it's very important to understand because there are funds for your tip to do to uh, for what you get for your project. However, um, the ECMS agreement will determine how much those agreements the agreement is, and so there might be money left over into on in the reimbursement agreement. However, that money um, will be put back into uh, the like we say the pot back into the pot to for the other programs other projects to be built. So, uh, very important. This is not a reimbursement program. Is it's not a grant program. It is a reimbursement grant program. Once you pay the agreement. Pay fine to be there, be for that. Um, okay, so we get into the engineering or third party agreement. This is where the agreement goes between the uh, the consultant and a local project sponsor receiving the project funds through a PennDOT uh, reimbursement agreement. So pretty much the agreement you have for engineering, the ECMS agreement will be between the consultant and local project sponsor, and then the re re reimbursement re agreement between its local sponsor and PennDOT. Um, Engineering agreement documents uh, both the, doc the consultants and local project sponsors responsibilities in the project development and delivery. Um, the engineering agreements can be used for preliminary design, final design, uh, services during construction, construction inspection, 
construction management, and also can use be for MBIS inspection also, which Anthony spoke of previously here, here this morning, uh, this afternoon here. And also in the ECMS, we also Grimms can set up an ECMS. So for local project sponsor, there's two ways you can uh, choose your sponsor, you can choose your consultant. You can choose them through a municipal engineer, or you can choose them through a consultant selection. Slide, please. So considering a, there's different, for the consultant selection approach or selection procedures, there's a large project procedures, which is contracts that total a total of over $150,000, and small project procedures are less than $150,000, or you, get, you can utilize your designated municipal engineer. Next slide, please. So before, to bring it on into this here, what this is, is Pub 93 is what we have here. This is a, uh, a manual publication that provides policy and guidance in the, in the procurement and administration of consultant agreements. So the goal here is to produce a quality transportation improvement for the public at a fair and reasonable cost within the project schedule and in a cost-effective manner. So this, this, this publication talks about preparing consultant agreements, selecting consultants, administering local, local agreements, and managing consultants. And this can be found on the web on the PennDOT website. Right. So for contracts that are large projects over $150,000, uh, the project must be advertised in ECMS and accordance to Pub 93 policy procedures. Uh, this requires solicitation of statements of interest or SOIs from the consultant business partners through a public advertisement through ECMS. Um, the consultants are final ranked. Um, the final ranked consultants will submit a technical and price proposal in order to execute the contract and to select and select a qualified consumer, consultant familiar with PennDOT or project project delivery process. So French, you want to get when you do consult this, there's a lot of project, uh, consultants out there that do a lot of PennDOT work out there and they're familiar with how we do things. And this they always the ones that do apply usually do have qualified they are qualified to do that because they have business partner access for that. So next slide. Um, so pretty much one we had there was less than less than uh, 150, which actually was a little less than that too. Is pretty much we have that. It's also just a little bit the same thing as Pub 93 also explains it in there too. Um, so municipal engineer, um, a lot of municipalities have municipal engineer that do some uh, work they have in the township or municipality uh, currently now. However, when you for use one for an ECMS project, this is where we have a little bit different. Um, this this size uh, this does not have to be selected using a, an approved competitive qualification-based selection procedure as per Problem 93. So the advertisement must be specified all engineering services that may be performed. So for instance, you want to do like say design, um, inspection, uh, right of acquisition, different things like that, that must be in the advertisement to do, to do that work. And the statement of interest, the SOI, must request professional qualifications, specific experience, and technical competence. Um, so once the, uh, you have a firm and you, you pick up this, you find your firm for that, you have your selection, the selection is then is approved by PennDOT. So once you send it, we send it to us and we kind of look at it and we get to Harrisburg and then it is a, the final selection is approved by PennDOT. And the designation of the municipal engineer is valid for a period of no more than five years. So every five years you go through the same process to go through to do this for your project. Uh, this is how you want to go through finding it for the project. Um, once, it's, uh, once your engineer is approved, then in ECMS, then you can go ahead and create a sole source agreement, which is the type of agreement you can do in ECMS. Um, this is here. We guess will be going into talking to uh, Justin. He'll be go ahead and do the talk about the PennDOT Connects. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. All right. Okay, uh, I'm going to go over PennDOT Connect real quick. I'll read through the slide, and then I'll talk about other options that, and other enhancements that we have for it. Uh, early coordination and collaboration with PennDOT, local governments, planning organizations, and stakeholders to get community input and identify opportunities to address safety issues, bicycle pedestrian accommodations, transit multimodal considerations, stormwater management, utility issues, and green infrastructure. Um, basically, what it is is <clears throat> I'll come out, or I'll try to connect with a township, borough, municipality, whatever, and try to talk about these issues. So the biggest things I'm looking for is, one of the biggest things I'm looking for is that there's a way we can enhance it for the betterment of the community. Uh, I wanna know about what school district uses the roads, uh, agriculture output, commodity industries, um, you know, where the closest industrial centers are. 
uh, biggest thing uh, as long as um, another thing would be stormwater management. You know, if there's if there's any drainage issues, it's it's better to pinpoint it, and then we can um, um, minimize that in the in the future. I'm also looking at utility issues as far as um, and other infrastructure issues. So it'd be like, are you going to have a stormwater project coming in? Is there going to be uh, a gas line put in? Things that you know might cause a utility cut across the road that we just paved. Um, and other uh, additional things would be bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Um, how basically how I do it is if you want to meet in person, we can over the phone, we can. Um, I've also had Miss Pau days are like, hey, we're really busy. So if you just give us the um, the connects form, we'll fill it out and we'll send it back to you. And it, it is actually beneficial because there has been um, projects in the past that I've been able to figure out a way to incorporate enhancements because there was a connects there was connects meeting done on it. Um, there's also been times where I couldn't get a participation from the community and I know I could have enhanced the project in a sense, but I couldn't get hold of them. So I didn't know if they wanted those enhancements or not. Um, so the biggest, the biggest thing is, you know, we're coming up to you with a local project, a project that's going to be in your local area. And we just want to know how can we put this into the community without really having a negative effect on the community and how we could possibly and I'm hoping in the future with this additional funding, we can do this more, enhance it for the local community. Um, that's basically what the PennDOT Connects project uh, program comes down to. And then I think I'm to hand it off to Dave Lehman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, some components such as the scope, the estimate, and the schedule, all three uh, very large um, items for delivering our projects. So the first one here is the scoping field view. This is a very important item. It is done in the field, um, so please keep that in mind. There was some times there where a lot of these meetings were held virtual, but you know we found that um, much more productive to have them out in the field where everyone can see the project, um, look at any existing issues, uh, have all the various units there from environmental bridge roadway um, safety section maintenance construction you know there's a lot of people at this type of meeting here and it really goes over the scope and intent of the project um, discussions on purpose and need of the project um, the the project manager uh, needs to be well prepared for this meeting um, looking at some existing criteria such as the adt truck traffic um, any sort of issues that the municipality may know exist, um, local businesses nearby, all those items get discussed very early on in the project, and that's called the scoping field view. Um, the next item here is the project cost estimate. Uh, we're seeing costs up, down, and all around right now. Most of it is going up. Um, there, this is not a one-time document that gets submitted at the end of the project. Um, this is a very dynamic document. Cost estimating should be going on throughout the entire project, through all the different submissions um, as a consultant um, sees an increase or decrease in any major unit cost, the estimate should be updated. Um, it also needs to be done by um, you know, a qualified consultant that's worked on PennDOT projects in the past. Um, you know, we, we don't really need the expert out there on drywall costs from Lowe's and Home Depot. We're a lot more concerned with the, the cost of steel, concrete, rebar, asphalt, you know, things like that. Um, so again, that is that is constantly being updated um, throughout the project. Uh, next one here is project schedule. It needs to be realistic based on the PennDOT timeframes. We have critical scheduling issues throughout design. Normally it's our right-of-way acquisition, um, coordination with utilities, developing utility relocation plan, any sort of permits going through the agencies from the conservation district, um, Army Corps of Engineers, DEP. Um, so, you know, right away utility permits are big one that, uh, you know, not all municipalities out there are familiar with that. So you have to really rely on you know, the consultants to be familiar with uh, those issues that we run into. Uh, another one here is consultants experience, um, whether it's bridge, roadway design, 
environmental, geotech. Uh, we definitely need the consultants working on these projects to be familiar with the type of project we have at hand. Um, there's many steps, many submissions to our design process. Uh, none of this happens overnight, you know, anywhere from 18 months to two years for a typical bridge design project. Um, so we do rely you know, on the consultants to be familiar with you know, what's going on. And every project's unique. There's no cookie cutter answer out there um, for, for project after project. There are some similarities between jobs for sure, but unfortunately we just don't have a magic wand to apply a design from one job to the next and, and everything works out. Um, so again, a lot of different types of projects out there and everyone is definitely unique. Um, so next slide, please. And here's a flow chart um, to basically lay out some timeframes of project delivery. A, we do have um, the planning and programming stage, you know, for state and federal funded projects. It takes six months to two years. Um, that's when the projects get identified. Um, you're working to get them programmed on the tip. Um, the next one is what we call the project startup phase. Uh, this is going through reimbursement agreements, selecting a consultant, getting a consultant on board. Um, and that takes anywhere from about three to 12 months. So you can see sometimes we may be 12 to 15 months uh, working on a project and not much has really happened yet. The design hasn't quite started. Um, a lot of these upfront phases here are administrative. Um, can get long, a little bit tedious, you know, quote unquote paperwork. But uh, you can see we're 15 months in and, you know, this, the project hasn't really started as far as the design goes. Um, the third phase of project development is the design. And the design gets broke, broken out into two parts. We have preliminary engineering and final design. So at the onset of PE, kind of transitioning between the project startup and the preliminary engineering phase is when you want to hold that scoping fill view that I talked about on the last slide. Um, it really sets the tone and the scope of the project, so there's no major surprises at the end. Um, and again, that happens at the end of the project startup and really early in preliminary engineering. Um, some major components to complete preliminary engineering is the environmental clearance document, and it's the preliminary design for the bridge and roadway. Um, we meet with utility companies, we establish um, potential right-of-way acquisition limits, um, preliminary bridge types, and then that takes anywhere from about four to eight months on state-funded projects and four to 14 months when we have federal funding. Just you know, a couple more hoops to jump through and some things like that when, when there's federally funded projects. Uh, moving on, same thing with final design. Uh, we want to complete final design. That's the final detailing of the project. Um, items here are like the final traffic control plan, um, the right-of-way acquisition, appraisals, negotiation, and settlements are going on in final design. Permits are being submitted, reviewed, and approved. And again, the, the final detailing for the bridge roadway design. Uh, we also have um, safety review meetings. We have constructability review meetings. Uh, maybe if to go back out in the field to look at some items. And this takes uh, eight months to one and a half years for state funded jobs. And realistically, it's going to take about a year, year and a half for the federally funded projects. Uh, once at the end of final design is when the project um, gets assembled in ECMS. We put together the PSE package and project gets advertised anywhere from five to seven weeks for contractors to bid on. There is a question and answer period at this time. Uh, contractors have the ability through ECMS to ask questions, and it's up to the um, you know the consultant usually to answer them. Sometimes it's a pen dot issue, but there is a question and answer period during the advertisement prior to bidding. And at the end of final design is the bid, uh, where the project uh, will be awarded then to the lowest bid contractor. And the final phase is construction. Uh, we're seeing most. Um, small medium projects taking one to two years in the construction phase. Um, if there's some significant utility relocations that may eat up a couple months early on in the project. So even some of our small jobs may take two years where the first year might be related to some utility relocations. And then the second year is, you know, the bulk of the actual construction of the project. Um, I do want to note here in the left hand side, 
some things if you're looking at a job early on um, that may cause some some difficulties to get through any sort of historic bridges, any other sort of historic structures nearby. Um, I know right away acquisitions here. Um, it is a process of appraising property, um, developing offers, going through negotiations. Um, you know, we may run into some unknown owners. That's an automatic condemnation. Um, that takes time. And of course, sometimes property owners just don't agree with the offer or, you know, whatever part of the project. And, and there is a condemnation process. So that is a, a long process. Um, you know, the quickest it can go through is about nine months, but we're seeing, you know, 12 to, to 15 months on about average there for right away. If there's any parks, recreational areas nearby, uh, that's title is 4F. Um, that takes some extra effort in the preliminary engineering phase, can also add time to their um, endangered species, archeology, span railroad involvement, utilities and permitting. So those are all large components there of a project that can really add time and effort um, to the overall project schedule. Um, especially uh, railroads right now, um, you know, sometimes they're difficult to meet with. There are railroad requirements as part of the projects. Maybe it's updating some of their facilities with lights and gates. Uh, maybe our pavement is hitting their, their crossing and it may require an update to the actual at grade crossing as well. So keep that in mind if there's any railroads nearby, especially if they're within five, 600 feet, and chances are you're gonna have some, some railroad involvement there. Um, so that covers my slide here on project development. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, just wanted to uh, come back here, a couple more slides here, then uh, finish up my talk here. Um, so publication, pub uh, 740. This is a Pendel publication here. It's called the Local Project Delivery Manual. Um, this gives us a confirmation of uh, department policies, procedures relating to procurement, design, letting, construction inspection, and management for construct contracts, projects sponsored by local public agencies. So, uh, if, you, if you if you've been enough uh, for been a part of this for a while, there there's been different manuals you've seen coming through there in the past. What they had done with this seven, pub 740, they combined them all into one, so you don't have to go find different ones for this. So if you have a question about this, it's usually in pub 740 and also the pub 93, as I said earlier, that's one. Those two minutes be important to uh, look at and to um, review as, as, you, as you can. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so in summary, um, a, lot, a lot of stuff was said here today. Um, I'm sure, said when we get back here and talk about it again, it'll be you know, let's do it. Let's do it later on here. We'll make sure we get what how we have here. But um, kind of start off here is for the the PennDOT business partner first. You yeah, become business partner to do it. Do work with PennDOT, and that's through uh, you get ECMS access and that's through the website. Um, and then also you need to obtain a SAP vendor ID number, and that's specifically for just your for your um, municipality. Um, and once you get those accesses, then you will be receiving the RAS access, the RAS access, which is the reimburse agreement system access. And this is required on all local projects. So you have to have an agreement with that for all, all of them done. So you have to make sure you get ECMS first and then the RAS uh, access is the two processes for those. Um, and then uh, also you want to follow the procedures and guidelines in Pub 93 and also Pub 740. Uh, these are very, very, again, very important manuals you can get a hold of. If you need a copy of them, let me know. I can get those two for you. Also, the eligibility to receive federal and state funding depends on the compliance with federal and state laws and regulations. So um, different funding has different um, things to hang with it. So depending on what type of money you're looking for for your project, that's what we're, there's going to be different, different things strings attached to that, as we say. Um, local project sponsor is responsible for its procuring engineering services of a qualified consultant, managing the design process and addressing the utility right away and environmental requirements, as well as managing the project through um, from construction to the two from design all the way through to the construction phase. Um, and one thing is a uh, consultant with Pendo experience is very important uh, to project delivery. It does help know what they have to do that, but uh, we can get help, help them guide them through. And and don't worry, you know, we some of the stuff here is how do we do this stuff? I'm not sure how to do any of this thing. Um, the staff here, District 10, SPC, everything, where we are, we are able here to provide you both assistance and guidance uh, for way we need to help us out to do those things. Uh, next slide. 
So pretty much, you know, for any information you need there or questions you have, you know, maybe uh, you can contact myself here. My, my full name is Jason Barkey. I'm the district town project manager, and is my email. And also uh, Justin Ruggles also is there too. For he's the district town planner, and his email also with that. So with that, thank you very much. And back to Dom, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, really important point on that last slide at the very bottom. Help is available help is available. So don't hesitate to ask for help. Technical assistance, you heard from the experts here at PennDOT, uh, you know, don't hesitate and don't wait for your bridge to be uh, in, in too terrible shape to ask for that kind of help. So uh, or, um, that, that's all I want to stress there. I thought that was a good point at the very end. Next slide. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to, next slide. So, you know, a lot of these additional resources that we have here, again, we're going to include this presentation as a follow up. Uh, you'll, you'll get these slides if you registered. Um, and, and these are just the additional resources. Uh, a lot of them were mentioned as part of the presentation. Um, the PennDOT Bridge webpage, really, really good resource. As the one, the, the thing I like about this uh, link is it connects you to a bridge conditions map, and that will show you the bridge conditions for all state bridges and all local bridges, uh, 20 feet, uh, greater than 20 feet in length. And, you know, it'll, it'll tell you right on that map, you know, when you, you have a couple of clicks, what condition, good, fair, or poor your, your local bridge is, in, is currently in. Uh, the SPC local bridge funding guidance, uh, Ryan mentioned that, I, again, uh, provides links and information to uh, obtaining funding for, for bridges. Um, and it's been recently updated to include the new funding available uh, from the uh, newer Infrastructure Jobs Act. Uh, Publication 740, local project delivery, uh, also a, a good resource beginning to end, how to deliver a local project, including a local bridge project. Publication 93, Policies and Procedures for the Administration of Consultant Agreements. Um, you know, when you have federal and state money involved, there are rules about how you procure and manage consultants and consultant agreements. PennDOT Connects, again, the link is there. You know, you heard connect early and often with local governments on, on, in the planning process of these projects. And then uh, last but not least, there are some mapping uh, uh, links there to PennDOT's one map and some some dashboards there. I wasn't sure, Ryan, whether you wanted to open any of those up, but they're there and we'll provide those links uh, as part of um, you know, the presentation that, that you'll receive. Yeah, I think the intent was that the um, People registered will will get a copy of this. They'll be able to explore some of these links on their own. Um, I did add one additional slide just for the folks to get a couple of the. These were all like these were the people that presented in the main contact emails. So that'll be that'll be in what goes out to all the registrants too. And I just thought that might be yeah. some key contacts yeah. might be helpful. Yeah. Why don't you leave that up? Why don't you leave that up? And uh, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but before I open the floor, I just want to um, thank, you know, PennDOT District 10. Thank you, Alice and your staff. Uh, thank North Central Commission. Thank you, Amy. And thank Northwest Commission. Thank you, Travis. A lot of good information here today. I hope the folks that registered and and are here um, <laughs> absorb a lot of that information. I know it's a lot to absorb, but I think it's a lot of good information moving forward in trying to get more of these uh, local bridge projects done. I know in the SPC region, 25% uh, of our local bridges are in poor condition. And so um, you know, we're, we're, we, we need to keep chipping away at that number. Um, so with that, I think since I don't see any questions in the chat box, unless you tell me differently, 
Brian or John. I'll just open up. Uh, if you want to op open up the floor, or open your mic to to make any comment or ask any question. Please go go ahead. And if not, uh, if you have any follow ups, you have you're going to get this. You're going to get this uh, presentation. So you have people's contact information. You have sections of the presentation that if you had a question on, you have that particular person's contact information. But uh, I'll just open the floor up right now. Thanks, Bob. We, I just want to say thanks. And, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to go over all of these topics and, you know, make our contacts known to all the municipalities out there. That way, if there are questions or um, anybody's trying to work through something that they don't hesitate to give us a call. Thanks, Alice. Anybody else? I'm not hearing any. So again, thank you all for participating in today's workshop. Again, if there's any follow up, we'll be getting the presentation out and uh, we did record this. So, you know, uh, if we get, if give you a link to the recording, you can share it to others who could not make it today. So thank you everybody for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks all. Thanks, Harold.